you know, when you watch uh, cable news, it's it's usually like one topic. And prior to the pandemic, it was all election, it was all 45 and post uh, um, COVID, it was all COVID, all COVID all the time. And um, since uh, the murder of George Floyd, it's all George Floyd all the time. And um, I, I'm seeing more and more um, video representation of unarmed African-American men killed by policemen. And although I think it's really important that we know about this, it's really disturbing to just watch this uh, unending stream of snuff films of, of black men dying live on TV. And um, I'm really, it, 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 it makes me angry and, you know, I, and, and I just don't see white people dying like this on TV. And I, and, and I, you know, um, and, um, yeah, I, um, I'm largely, you know, um, uh, when I look at TV, I'm angry. I, I have to um, um, step away. You know, I can't, you know, I can't watch it for, for very long. Um, I get angry, I've been crying. It's, it's a really hard time to be a young black man in, in, in America and it's not that much easier to be an old black man in America. Huh? And I dare say every black man, if you're 30 years older, uh, has a police story, you know? And, um, 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 but I mean, under all that anger is hope because I feel like somehow it's, it's, it's a little different this time. So, yeah. I, I think it's, I had a, I, I talked to my, my good friend Danetta this morning, <laughs> I talked to all the time, because I had a little panic attack yesterday, uh, another one, another and another and another. Uh, uh, as, as, as now the rhetoric has changed to this time, it will be different. This time we're really making um, some headway. This time change will be, and I was like, feeling that like, yes, with will, with sustained will and absolute freaking focus, we can actually drive past this uh, for once in our history, our really troubled history as Americans. And then it occurred to me, oh no, we have been here exactly here before. It was called post-Civil War Reconstruction. It was called post-68. We were in that place where we were sure things were different. We were positive we would not go back to that um, uh, um, place where there was uh, no light or no hope, and many people were outside of the system of um, uh, privilege uh, um, and bounty. And we've actually been exactly where we are right now. We've been here before. And if in a year we emerge and we're feeling like we've been heard as black artists, as black artists, as brown artists, as people of color, as indigenous artists, we're feeling like we've been heard, we're getting some progress. The moment you take your eyes off the prize, somebody back here is sneaking up and taking back their shit. That's what's happening. And then we end up here again in three years, four years, five years, six years, seven years, 10 years. And so I had, uh, I mean, I literally was like, oh no, oh no. How do we actually not go back to post reconstruction Jim Crow? How do we not exit our late sixties uh, social justice movement, you know, that was ushered in by Rosa Parks who wasn't waiting for somebody to join her on the back of the bus. How do we, and then end up in the eighties with trickle down economics. How do we not do that this time around? And I don't know the answer except that, oh my God, the amount of sustained will that it's going to take is enormous. Yeah, for the longest time I've been thinking, you know, really hoping and wishing that we had a transformative president who could um, project empathy. But now I'm thinking that maybe 45 is just the right person for this because he's going to incite, he's going to push. And, and uh, it, if we had, if, if Hillary was in office, I think um, there would be this uh, message from uh, from above, a message from the the, the, the White House of, of somebody who cared. Um, um, we got somebody who doesn't really care, and um, 
he's actually inciting it and he's like pouring gasoline on it. So I think, I feel like that's what's different. There's nobody to, to say, it's gonna be okay, it's gonna be okay. I just watched a video where he was like at a rally saying, you know, spoofing, I can't breathe. I just, I thought it was a, um, I thought it was a, 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 some kind of meme, but I looked it up and it was actually him like spoofing, I can't breathe. It was in February, it was pre-George Floyd, but still, I mean, so he's gonna incite, you know, and I think maybe, maybe, maybe that's what's different. Yeah, we've got an arsonist in the way. <laughs> <laughs> actually gonna set the whole thing on fire. I don't know, all I need to do is like, you know, blow on it a little bit. <sighs> you know, okay. that's, that's, what, that's what I need to do. He's actually setting the whole thing on fire. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, and how do we like, what is what happens? You know, what are the, what do these ashes look like? And how do we rise from the ashes? Or what's the, you know, what's the new landscape that we're gonna plant? And we need everybody on board. I've been saying like all hands on deck, y'all. And don't be afraid. Like I, I there's a, I, you know, I was in a, a, a conference last week um, where you know uh, black artists were invited to uh, speak truth to power, and it was like an interminable amount of silence in that room because that room was was populated with people who run things, right? And people can give you jobs and help you pay your rent and, you know, uh, get you on a cover of a magazine, get your play published, all people who can do things. And the silence was so heartbreaking. And it's my silence too, that we're like, oh gosh, I can take this moment to speak truth to power and then never work again, never be able to make a living in the profession that is um, where you find comfort and joy. Um, and that we are just, it's, it's um, what does it take? for me, uh, speaking just for me, what does it take for me um, to be okay with standing by myself in a space, you know, uh, with not moving forward uh, to say the right things, to say uh, the things that matter, to call folks uh, um, uh, out and forward, even if I'm there by myself. Mm. How do we do, like, how do we do that? I love the quote, I was thinking of Rosa Parks today, it's, um, Grace Lee um, Boggs, who, who said, uh, um, each of us needs to discover and exercise the power within us that enabled Rosa Parks to choose not to go to the back of the bus without waiting to see if others would join her. And that's where we are. Black folks, white folks, brown folks, we have to actually like not look to the side or behind us to see if anybody's gonna come with us and just take the freaking step forward. And I'm saying that to myself, I'm saying it, I have to keep saying it. It's like, just go forward, your heart is beating, your heart is beating, but uh, we gotta occupy that space, even if nobody else will. James, you, 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 I keep, I, I think of you, 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 you have these, sp uh, you occupy spaces, nobody else dares to. You do that as a, as a writer, as a, as a conceiver of world. I mean, places that are really um, painful. Like you're at, you ask us to stand inside of other people's shoes and you really force that as an idea. It's like how to how to how to actually bring somebody into the experience that you have as a black man or that I have as a black woman. I really appreciate you for that. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I um, it's funny because literally, let's say Tuesday tomorrow, um, live streaming disposable men, which was the um, um, show that I did in two thousand five, which was about. Um, it was a solo piece, um, and it was right after Amadou Diallo was shot by 41 bullets, 19 hitting his body. And I was really just, really just angry. I had gotten stopped by the police and I'm just like, I wanted to do something. And I did this piece, Disposable Man, and it talked about various um, ways that men like look like me have been disposable. And this was 2005 and I was exploring the phenomenon of unarmed black men being killed by policemen, fully expecting this to be a phenomenon that would end. Um, and it has only grown. And, um, you know, when, when Tamil and I, we did, uh, we did Three Fists, which was uh, 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 certainly inspired by Disposable Men, where we put people into um, spaces that, um, 
black people specifically black men occupy um i made a huge discovery i think i told tamla this time like every single night i had a white person come up to me and say i'm so uncomfortable as if they'd never been uncomfortable before and it was like and i realized that you know and maybe it's a fallacy but i mean being a black man i'm uncomfortable a lot of times you know i go in the store i'm uncomfortable it's you know i'm you know i just deal with it but I had white people come up to me like they were they were uncomfortable and and couldn't get out of it. And Tamala had devised these ways where we're, if people were uncomfortable, we would just push them deeper into the experience to 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 have them stay engaged with it. And the the hope was that it wasn't like sadistic, but it was the hope was to be to force or to foster real empathy, you know. And and you really can't be that empathetic if you don't really know what's going on with other people, but um, that's the kind of work I'm really interested in, and, and thank you for mentioning that. But it's it's so I'm finding it more and more difficult to get it shown, you know, because it's, it's yeah. I mean, I I, I think um, uh, one of the things that is really incredible to me about Three Fifths was and this was also funny. I, I was just telling this story not that long ago that you know people got to choose if they would have the they could either, they were met by, uh, uh, um, they were greeted at the front by someone who was blind and could, and they could say, and she said, what, are, are you black or are you white? And she would mark their forehead with either a black grease pin or a white grease pin because it would, it would, it would, um, uh, shape your experience in supremacy land. So supremacy land, First of all, it's called supremacy land and it's a carnival where you celebrate all things white and supreme. And I was like, uh, we had a debate on this, I think, James. I was like, nobody's going to choose to be black. Who would do that? <laughs> <laughs> and the amount of, you know, white folks that chose to be black, and then they were upset that they didn't have, they didn't get to do some stuff. And I was like, they got less money and less access. That's, <laughs> that's exactly what happens. You don't get to do some stuff when you. <laughs> When you're black. And I thought it was like, yes, this is the point. It's like you get you go into this experience called supremacy land, which is also called America. And, you know, and there are some things you don't have access to because you're black. And then a lot of the black folks were like, I'm going to be white. <laughs> I know what happens in supremacy land. And they got to do all of the things. Money and everything. They were able to see everything. So, yeah. yeah, yeah more yeah. money. And it's just like, how do you like, and it, and I you know I've been saying this like ad nauseum that black artists are the have the to me you know to me the greatest freaking imagination in the American theater because they have to figure out how to tell the same story again and again and again in a different way so that you understand what we're saying to you which is look over here at my humanity see me and try to erase all the stories you've been told about this skin. And it's just like, you know, and so finally James makes a whole carnival <laughs> called Supremacy Land. And folks have to spend 90 minutes with us, you know, either being tortured or lauded, depending on the color of your grease paint, being excluded or included, depending on the color of your grease paint. It was a real challenge. We, 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 um, we had, I don't know, 10, 15 booths and each one was uh, fun. Like uh, there was the, the reasons to be Lynch Wheel of Fortune, where you know you spin the wheel and you land on a uh, on a on a date like a uh, 1929, and you get five reasons why a black man could be Lynch. One of which was like skipping stones, and you would have to tell um, you have to say which one is not true, and they were all true. And it's funny, I was listening on the news today. This guy got. Um, shot by a policeman and it, it was a situation that escalated from literally he was riding with his bright lights on and he did not dim them when the police passed. So it's kind of like 1929, like as a black man, I can die because I don't dim my lights when I pass a policeman. And it's, you know, we did it, it was like a spoof. It's like kind of reminding people that, you know, and in a fun way, but it, it got in, you know, we were really interested in having this information, you know, live inside of, of people and, and to see the, the, the horrible nature of our history. And it's still, I mean, this guy 
I mean, George Floyd, but it was a $20 bill, you know, it's these ridiculous, bill. ridiculous things like let it fucking go. It's a $20 bill. But also, you know? if you like there, this, this is a fraudulent $20 bill. How many fraudulent institutions <laughs> that make money are there with real money? You know, $20, it's crazy. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's funny how things really just haven't changed, you know? Um, it's not funny, James. It's absurd. It is absolutely heartbreaking and absurd. And I think that's what it's been. That's what's been so like, um, I don't know. I'm just like, wow, you know, what is, what will it take? And then we just like, okay, well, let's just start doing you know, just start doing because we don't know what it will take. You know, what it will it take? And I mean, it was a time when, uh, at least in a situation like this, people can gather in a black box theater with their knees touching and, and experience something that could be um, helpful to process the experience, but that is a, a year away or more from now. So, um, and artists are now charged with figuring out like, well, how do we, how do, what do we do now? What do we do now um, in the absence of, of, of theaters um, as we know them? And I wonder if they're ever gonna come back. I mean, I, you know, like Camp Tamala, you know, you do, you do um, work outside of theater and um, all of a sudden that's like, everybody's like doing work outside of theater and people are realizing that they can't just like, shoot a play on video and stick it online and 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 have it you know um work so it's it's a real you know it's a it's a real series of decisions and and um and um yeah james i don't think i ever asked you this question i don't yeah. know if this is a, and maybe it's a different answer now than it was when we first met but why do you do theater you were making a lot of money before you decided to do this. I was. No, I was. I worked at Windows in the World. I was. I was on vacation when 9/11 hit, and um, when that hit, um, I had um, always been like this pipe dream artist. I was like, you know, when fill in the blank happens, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be an artist. But uh, I was working at Windows in the World. I was making six figures. It was 9/11. I was on vacation, due back on the 12th. And when that happened, I was like. I got nothing to lose because I've, I've always been this this guy to like like starving artist was a phrase that was in my mind and i'm like i kind of like to eat every day i'm kind of selfish like that so uh, but when 9 11 hit um everything shifted and i felt like i got a second chance and um i you know i just started um I had some time to think about what was rolling around in my, my mind. And I was no longer, I, I decided I was not gonna be a pipe dream artist and I was gonna do stuff. And, um, and I did, and I didn't go to school. So I didn't know what can't be done. And I'm like, I am so grateful for that. Cause I got a feeling they tell you in school when you go to your MFA, your first play doesn't get done. It doesn't get toured. You don't get a New York times review. It just doesn't happen. You know, I did, a, and I, all of that happened and it's not because i'm exceptional i think a lot large, largely it's because i embrace ignorance that um uh, benefits me like i don't know what i can't do therefore i'm gonna try like i came to tamala and i met her and i'm like i want to do this piece and it's gonna be uh we're gonna take over 3ld and call it supremacy land like it was crazy crazy ambitious um but there's there's ignorance you know that and and having done it with 23 actors 22 video projectors 30 collaborators um five theatrical spaces looking back on it now i don't know how we did it you know it was really we dumb. didn't know we couldn't do it but yeah. we knew that we had to do it <laughs> literally yeah. i'm like every night i would go home and it would just be like oh god but um uh, and i don't know that i'd do it again certainly not um without money but um I think, right. you know, but, but also, the, answer, the answer to your question is like ignorance. I'm like, I'm really, I am really, I'm really, um, I, I covet and embrace ignorance that be, benefits me, you know, like, cause if I don't know, I can't do it, I'll try it. And I might fail and that's okay, but I'll learn something from it. 
but I, I don't I don't like the whole notion of somebody teaching me what I can't do. Yeah, you are a highly untamable artist. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. You are not, yeah, you will not be put in a box <laughs> of any sort. It's like the moment you see the box, you just like, where's the wall? Where's the hammer? <laughs> like, break this thing down. Mm -hmm. Right. What's the hammer? What it, what it, what hammer do you want to bring now? Um, I don't, you know, I'm like, I'm kind of torn, you know, because I, I, I get, um, and you probably heard this as well. There's this whole notion that performing trauma is inflicting trauma. And I've gotten a lot of pushback from academia and from um, people in theaters that, you know, like my work is traumatic, you know, and I, it baffles me because I mean, my history is traumatic. There's literally at a biologically measurable level trauma in my bloodstream that can be measured. Um, it's been discovered that trauma can be passed on from traumatic events and the event that they, they choose to use is the Holocaust and they've, they've traced it to um, Jewish people who are alive now and they can see that trauma. Um, so I'm sure that the trauma of 400 years of slavery and black codes and Jim Crow and um, um, red line, all that stuff is, 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 is in my body and in, in the body of, of, of other people who look like me, but studies won't be done because if they discover that then reparations is the next step. So what do mm -hmm. we do then? So, you know, it, it, um, it, it, it kind of annoys me when, when people seem to be like, um, concerned about trauma. I mean, and I get it. I mean, not trauma for trauma's sake. I'm not trying to do Texas Chainsaw Massacre history, but I mean, literally our history is really, you know, charged with atrocities that are largely unimaginable and, and they continue. And um, I, I don't have a problem like mining this grist for my mill. Um, and I think one of the reasons why um, I, uh, I'm in a position where I do a piece and then people are like, okay, well, you did that well, you know, um, and I did, I got a creative capital grant and there, I got, uh, I got a chance to sit with uh, several theaters and I told them about, I was telling them about Supremacy Land and Three Fists and, and um, all of these are household name theaters. They all, they were all white people and they all smiled politely and nodded and they backed away with their hair on fire and they're like, <laughs> good luck with that shit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> never to be heard from again. And I get it. I get it, you know, um, but I'm not really interested in theater that makes you feel comfortable. I'm interested in theater that can elicit change. And I'm not saying that I'm that powerful that I can elicit change, but I, I, I can as a theater artist, you know, when I collaborate with incredible directors like Tamala, um, we can put people in situations where they will at least go, hmm, you know, for a, a moment. A moment. I'm thinking about um, George Floyd's family and I'm from Houston and um, mm. the, his, him being laid to rest and uh, unexpected <laughs> thing here uh, that somebody had to lose their son and their father brother. and their brother that they had to make a sacrifice so that we can learn a little bit. And it's so sad that um, black bodies keep being sacrificed and we don't learn enough to actually move the needle. And it is just devastating to me. And I did not expect to, I expect to come and be like smart and quippy um, today, sorry. Um, but um, this very moment, somebody saying an eternal goodbye to someone that they love. And that is so hard. Yeah. That is so impossible. When I saw the, the video, I was thinking about um, the, um, I mean, I think part of it is like we, images like that should be shown, but I mean, how would you feel if that was your brother's son 
uncle, cousin, to to look at that live on TV. It's just, it's the pain is unimaginable. And the policeman's face was identical to the faces um, in the book Without Sanctuary, where there were there were groups of white people pointing up to uh, yeah. A lynched body, and this white these white people were unafraid to be photographed. It's like I'm here, and there's a dead body, and what the fuck, you know? And it's just, and I wonder, do do white people not get killed by policemen, you know? And is it is do do I? Because I don't I don't ever remember seeing the moment, except for John F. Kennedy. Uh, a, a moment of a white person dying live on TV or, or on TV. It's it's blurred or they cut away or because it's it's too much. And the thing is like, you know, black bodies, it's okay to show the actual death, the actual snuff film. It's like, it's okay. It's not okay. It's, I mean, that's not okay to do it. You know, I'm like, <sighs> It, and it's and and for whatever reason now with uh, with this George Floyd thing, it's the floodgates have opened. Every time I turn on TV, I see yet another police video, and I saw one today where they had the, the body cam, and they had the image of the guy who was he was he was clearly dead, and they're like opening his eyes up to see you know and. It's possible that until this moment because of COVID and this sort of like meeting point where the whole world is in the same, in one of the same situations at least, uh, that we could sustain, we, me, could, I could sustain an idea that if this place doesn't work, this America, I'll go somewhere else. There is nowhere to go. <laughs> <laughs> And so perhaps what's happening, I don't know, is that we're all recognizing there's nowhere to go. We can't jump ship. There's nothing, there's nothing else out there except for the ground that we stand on and that we have to actually just go and make it better. And, and, and it is not incumbent just on me, my body, my experience to make that better, that um, folks have to take their hands out of their pocket. Yes. And yes. get off our knee off our Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you were saying that this this may be the same, and it may be the same, it may blow over. I don't think so, because I've never seen so many white people um, marching and protesting and, and saying Black Lives Matter and, um, and um, talking about racism, you know, because it, 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 I feel like for the majority of my life, and, you know, I'm, I'm old, so, but I feel like, um, Racism in America has been a, a black problem, you know, and it's clearly not, you know, it's it's an American problem, and we're starting to shift to 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 that to to, to like okay, well, it's because white people are now talking about racism, and I've always thought that you know rich people don't need to talk about money, and white people don't need to talk about race. <laughs> you know, why bother? You know, I got it. You know, we got it. You know, unless you know, coffee table. You know, you know, at, at the at the um, the cocktail party. But white people are talking about race and, and racism, and you know, and and I'm being bombarded by you know these images and emails from all these theater and art organizations saying that we're down with the cause and you know and all of that, um, which I've never experienced before. And you know, I'm hoping that it's not like a blip. You know that it it does it does amount to something now. What what's something? I, and I've never. I mean, maybe maybe I haven't followed the news closely enough. But I mean, defunding the police police um, departments um, is now like a thing. You know, it's something to consider. You know, it's like we don't even understand what they're talking <laughs> about. <laughs> I feel like it's I'm, I'm like I'm not really clear either. Like, but I mean, I I gotta be honest. I'm like. If something happened to me, I would think really long and hard before I called the police because the last time I called the police was not a good scene. What um, happened last yeah, time? Yeah, you should tell. Yes, what please happened? tell that. Yeah. Um, oh, Frank, you were there. You... <laughs> um, 
I live with my husband who happens to be a white man. And um, I, I bought a, 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 a townhouse in Jersey City from my other life when I was working at Windows in the World and I was able to keep it, thank God. Um, anyway, we're home, we're you know living our life and um, we hear a window break, the alarm goes off and I see this man of color, very fair, sliding down the flue of my house, you know, the, the chimney and going away. And I'm like, we're looking around to see what happened. He broke the window. I don't know what else happened. So let me call the police because I have insurance. And I'm like, I don't, you know, I, I pay insurance. They can replace the window and, and the, the pipe and everything. Anyway, um, the guy who uh, uh, broke the window ended up coming back around to the house and he was talking to my husband and I came out there and I was talking to him and he was a young black man um, and he was bleeding, you know, you know, and he took off his shirt and he was holding, you know, um, wiping his hand with, with the blood. We got him paper towels and stuff like that. We were talking and I forgot that I called the police and I have a SUV, which is tall. And we're standing there talking and all of a sudden this tiny little policeman, he could like five, five, he appeared gun drawn. And he just like appeared out of nowhere, gun drawn, pointed it at me and the, the other man of color who broke into the, the house. And immediately we had to get on the floor, immediately. My husband who happened to be white was standing next to him and immediately became an ally. It was just, it was knee jerk, it was like, Two people of color, you must have did it, get on the floor. My husband's like, this man is, he owns the house. He's pointing the gun at me, telling me to get on the floor. And I was thinking, I don't have any ID because I'm in my pajamas. And I thought about going in the house, but I figured if I open up that door, of course I would be going in to get my AK-47 to kill him. And that would give him a reason to fear for his life and kill me. So I just sat the fuck down, you know, and, and the guy uh, who broke into the house was clearly more versed than I was because he laid down splayed um and my husband was freaking out you know and we finally got to the point where you know like we he explained that you know like i own the house my husband could go in there and get my id i couldn't i had to stand there um at gunpoint and um anyway it de-escalated finally and i asked him why did you come out with your gun because i called the police and i told them it is not an emergency this is largely for insurance purposes um, and why did you point it at me and not him? How come he didn't have to get on the ground? And he was just like, you know, he didn't have anything to say. And the funny thing was, although my husband um, is clearly not a racist, he didn't, you know, you don't understand how racism works, but he was shocked and shook by the event. And I was just like, whatever. I mean, if I was gonna put this on a graph, I would say that's probably what would happen, you know? I'm, I'm tall, uh, I'm perceived by a lot of people as big, and I'm dark-skinned, big, dark-skinned man, of course, um, I am uh, the adversary. Um, but I mean, after that, um, it, was, it, was, it, was, it took my husband a long time to get over it. I don't know if he's over it yet, but I mean, um, but that was a situation where I called the police because I, you know, and when, and now just thinking about, you know, calling the police, I'm like, I don't know how you do it correctly. I don't know how, you know, I, 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 unless, and I mean, I'm fortunate that I have this, 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 this white man, you know, my husband who, who can like be um, the white man in the situation because I certainly can't. Um, and all too often things escalate from this guy in New Jersey was shot dead because he didn't dim his lights. George Floyd was shot dead because of a $20, fake $20 bill. I could have been shot dead from, you know, this policeman fearing for his life. And, you know, it, it goes on and on. Um, and I mean, it, I, I don't think my story is unique. I'm like, I'm really grateful that I lived through it. Um, and um, like I said, I think every, every black man and probably woman who's gotten to the age of 30 has their uh, police story. Um, it's unfortunate, but it's true. It's the world we live in. And I mean, for real, for real, I don't know that I would call the police again. Because you should have just been able to call the insurance company and not call the police. Yeah, you got to do a police insurance report. company, right? I you know, know, I'll go out of police headquarters and do a police report with my husband in tow. Like, you know. But I was, tell I was telling Tamla, a friend of mine, she may be watching now, I was like, this heartbreaking story. 
she's black, her husband is black and they bought a little white dog. And they love that dog. I'm sure they love that dog, but largely they got that little white dog to soften the image of this big black man so that when he walks in his own neighborhood, people look at this big black man with a little foo-foo dog and they maybe think, oh, maybe he's gay or maybe he's, if you have a little dog like that, you, you know, you gotta be, you, you, I'm probably safe. But to literally have to go through that process and, and white people don't have to think about shit like that. Like, how do, how do I keep my, my husband safe? This woman has said, I'm gonna buy a little black, a little white foo-foo dog and we'll love that dog. But, you know, but to see a big black man with a little foo-foo dog, you know, and, you know, it softens his image. And, and, and I don't know that white people realize it, that we have to, this is what we have to do, you know, um, you know, to stay alive. And it's, it's tiring to say the least, you know, and it's, I mean, she told me that and I almost cried because it's just so sad um, that we have to go to these lengths and this is in her own neighborhood. And, you know, it, it makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, Ahmaud Aubrey, right? I mean, it's- Yeah, yeah, in his know. own neighborhood. How, how you can't you distinguish jogging from you know, running away <laughs> from, you know, it's just, yeah, we, we are, this is the thing to, you know, and it's the why I love the theater. Uh, it's an effort to be in charge of my own story. You know, it's an effort to put forward the image that I feel in me, mm. um, uh, the destiny um, that I feel in me, the one that I was born with, that hasn't been socialized out of me or, or mitigated um, through uh, or subjugated. Um, how to tell that story to myself, to the people who look like me, and then to the world that doesn't look like me to foster an empathetic connection, right? Mm -hmm. um, I love for the world to not have to be segregated by these concepts of color or gender or whatever the things are that help us put each other in boxes so we think we can understand them because we can just label the boxes. You know, how do we erase those boxes? How do we just erase it? And I, I try often to, you know, to inflict humor on it. I, when I was working at Windows in the World, I wore, I wore a suit. I wore a three-piece suit. I look good. <laughs> and <laughs> I got on the elevator with this white woman, and she literally clutched her bag. And I was like, and I clutched mine. I was like. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at me, and I think she realized how ridiculous it was. I mean, we're alone in the elevator. It's a big elevator. But I'm like, she, I mean, I could hear her clutch it. It was like. Clutch, and I'm like clutch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, instances of racism, like you know, uh, every, every, not every day, but all the time, all the time. Frank, what are other people saying? <laughs> well, you know, it's a, uh, It's a, a situation we are all in now that um, forces us to look at existential questions. If not now, when will we ever do it? I think we do listen perhaps a bit more careful than, than before. I think the reaction you know, to the, the killing of George Floyd is related to that. Um, and there is, nobody knows what is the moment you know, of change or not, but we, we talk to people around the world and. Um, and we hear stories from uh, from uh, from Chile, Guillermo Calderon. It's like the same police that was out shooting us and was trying to protect us. Wow, mm -hmm. we can't really make sense out of it. They stopped. They said there was a march of a women's day for one million and a half women. Three days later, the government shut everything down. They asked for a change of constitution, and and it's uh, it's confusing. And uh, so I think there's a great great injustice around the world. And uh, I think what's uh, heartbreaking is that America should be an exception. It should be different. It was the new land, uh, the uh, terrestrial paradise. Uh, it was the, uh, the nearer neighborhood, the ideas to, to create a world, new world, you know, that is um, not uh, 
bound by old European class structures and royal or dictators. And uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's heartbreaking to see that perhaps the civil war never ended, you know, it's just a break in between and um, hmm. what, will come, what will come out of it. So um, how did you both experience uh, the, the time of COVID, the time of being, how long have you been in your apartments and, uh, and where are you now? I've been here, what are we on, like 83 days or something like that. I've been here since the, the, the Broadway theater shut down. Uh, and, and we took, you know, took it seriously. My husband works for a pharmaceutical company uh, and I have, you know, some health concerns. And so we locked ourselves in and I have not been anywhere. I can't ride my bike and I ride my bike and I ride my bike and I ride it all the way back home. I do not stop. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and then all of my, um, all of my protesting has been with my keyboard uh, and with my, po my pocketbook and with whatever platforms or levels of, you know, sort of windows that I can open in any, any, any way, but also with really practical things like <laughs> like how do we you know how do, just exposing folks to the things that keep me moving because i think the thing that we're gonna need is we're gonna need some fuel that keeps this thing going and asking questions like what are, you know you know what are you what what are we afraid of um that that's it covid has been a perfect storm yeah i um I remember when it first, you know, first hit, and I would hear this phrase over and over again, um, that we should shelter in place and, you know, stay home. And immediately I thought, I'm like, I've never seen myself as a person of privilege, but I mean, right now, I mean, I have a home that's safe. Mm -hmm. um, my husband and I are compatible. Um, um, but, you know, all too often I hear people who have means, who people of privilege say shelter, shelter at home, you know, and, and stay safe. And a lot of people's homes are not safe, you know, and I think about how, you know, like this is the Petri dish for domestic violence, you know, and how, how people who have tiny, tiny spaces who, who opted to, to, I'm gonna live in New York, but I'm gonna live in a little closet, but I have access to the gym and the roof and you know, and now they're trapped in that little closet, you know, and and how how does that feel? Is that safe, you know? So um, it's it feels weird to be, you know, um, in this position of privilege and that I have a I have a home and I'm safe and I have a vehicle and I can go out, I put my mask on and my gloves and I go shopping and and I do all of that uh, that stuff. And I've, I've been really religious about, you know, doing the mask and gloves when I go out. And um, initially when I, when it's first um, hit and I was driving through and Plainfield is, it used to be, um, I don't know, I don't know what the percentage is, probably 50, 50 black, white. And now it's like um, a, a high uh, influx of uh, Latinos and um, black and some whites. Latino population is pretty much mask and gloves. White people are mask and gloves. But I went through a black neighborhood and, you know, people were like, you know, shaking hands and and it was, it just broke my heart. I mean, this was pre Idris Elba because I mean, it was like, there was a time when, you know, you know, um, rumor was if you're black, you can't get it. I don't know where this, that came from. Oh my God, but, I can guess. <laughs> 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 but Idris Elba got it. So it's like, okay, well, you're good. But now I'm seeing everybody in the supermarket, everybody's got the, you know, the, 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 the mask. And it's a, it's very surreal, you know, um, um, just going out. Cause in my house, I look out the window, I see birds and trees. When I go out, you know, and, and I'm in the community, it, it turns into a science fiction film with two pandemics, the political one and the racial one. And, and I wonder, um, Frank, and I know you, you don't speak for all white people, or do you? Do you speak for all white people? I forgot. No? Could you speak for some white people? Because I have questions, right? But I'm like, I'm what is the role? <laughs> what is the role for white people right now? What, what, yeah. what, 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 what is the role for white people right now in this, in this um, uh, racial pandemic? as you see it, and I know you're not, you know, the spoken. Mm, mm. Yeah, that's um, <clears throat> a good 
good good question uh foster wallace i think he, he he used that old image you know of the the fish in water you know that the fish doesn't know what water is because mm. it's in mm -hmm. it he doesn't even know it doesn't know what air is it doesn't know what's a forest maybe it doesn't even know what's you know earth and under the and i think um yeah i think for us and not easy to say, but yeah, for the, us, the white people, in a way, it is to understand that would we perhaps move in is similar. We just do not see it. We are not aware of it. We might be thinking about it. We might know about it. We have read about it. We saw a movie and a great play. But what does it feel like um, when you experience it? As you guys said, what if it's your brother, your father, your uncle, your cousin on TV, you know, that what, what, what does that really feel? And I do think, uh, James, what you said, uh, um, with the image, you know, the, the images, the endless repeating of images, you know, does it really, really help? What do we remember? Um, we see an image and we remember, then we see the image again, then we remember the image. And we see an image again, we see, remember the second, we are more and more removed. After 10 times, you remember the ninth image you saw before and not the experience, not the whole life that's been. We don't meditate on what theater does. And that's why I believe theater is there. It's good, you know, to create a complex story. And Susan Sontag wrote so beautifully um, on the suffering of others, where she says, you know, images of war. And this is a war, I think one could say. What do they do? What are the images from the paintings of Michelangelo, the civil, Spanish Civil War, the Holocaust images? What do they really tell us? The civil rights movement images, the Vietnam images, 9 11. Um, you know, someone dies, you just show endlessly the car accident in your family. No, you don't, you know, but what we see now is that. And it perhaps even takes us away, numbs us, and we have to really be able to be in the moment in the present and also see a whole story a whole life a whole situation that there is a system over hundreds of years and that it's not uh, you know just something died now in the moment and we have to fix it right now it's a very long thing and it's not an app can do it you don't go to therapy or go to a fitness studio no you know there are structures in place forms that have been created before us and we are called upon to change those forms, to make them work better. We have to be part of the struggle for, for, for liberty and for, um, for um, freedom. And we are maybe not enough. We haven't done enough. We haven't listened enough. We haven't seen enough. We've been a little bit blind and uh, a lot of blindness. And I think this is the role is to really, you know, be aware of what's us to see the world, how it really is and not how we think it is or wish it would be. It's all good in time to see how is it really? And that's, that's what I think. Yeah, James Baldwin, I think she, I think this wrote, you know, the artist's job is to correct the delusion. You know? Yeah, and then put forward the possibility. It's almost like um, in these times, the reality is so intense. It's like, um, you know, um, the resistance art, you know, like on CNN every day, you know, it's, 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 everything is hype, hyper, hyper, you know. Um, but I'm just, I keep going back to the fact that, you know, why is it okay? to show these snuff films mm -hmm. and you know and i'm wondering frank have you seen have you seen images of white people in the moment of their death because the ones that come to mind it's like they blur it it blurs because it's you know and it's it's all in, in my mind it's like you know mm -hmm. it was a time when you know it was okay to show black african women's breasts but not white women's breasts they got blurred. And now there's this, this time where it's okay to show to the Floyd family and the rest of the world the exact moment 
when this guy dies and it's okay. And they didn't blur it. And I'm like, I, you know, I'm kind of torn. Cause I, I, I feel like if it gets shown, it's going to, you know, it's going to do something, but do white people not die? Mm -hmm. I'm, I mean, I'm, that's a real question, not die, but I mean, mm. I mean, do white people not die on TV? Have you seen um, a, a white person um, his last moments, including his death on television and not blurred? No. Just Have you? As you say, maybe the Kennedy assassination is the only one that comes to mind that's been prominently kind of a no. Like mm -hmm. where, you know, like where, uh, uh, George Floyd, you know, his $20 bill, um, um, and this guy in Jersey, and I don't know his name, was because he didn't dim his lights. And then you have um, serial killers or, you know, people that killed everybody in the room, like Dylan Roof, who walks out and goes to Burger King, you know, and, you know, it's just, it's really daunting. Like, you know, it's literally like, I have this whole notion of, and I, I did, we did a little bit of, of it in, 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 in Three Fists where um, I feel like sometimes my actual skin is weaponized. Like just mm -hmm. my, my, my darkness, you know, is a weapon and, um, and it is fearful enough for me to get killed. And I had this like reoccurring fantasy, like if I got out of my car and I was buck naked, would I still be fearful or would I be more fearful, you know? And uh, we did a shoot where we had these um, beautiful black dancers, nude, um, uh, performing, getting shot by uh, and, and falling. And um, it, it, is, it is literally, I really feel like there's something there, like my skin is weaponized, you know? Um, I've been in situations where, you know, I was around uh, police officers or, you know, and, and I'm like in my mind, I'm trying, I'm trying to project like, I'm nice, I can say a whole paragraph, you know? I'm like, you know, project my inner white woman and project my light skinness and fold my dick in half so there's no envy, you know? But I'm like, I'm tired, I'm tired. I'm like, you know, this, this poor woman that has to buy a little white foo-foo dog for her husband. Why do we have to do this, you know? And it, and I mean, the answer is because, well, if you want to live, you know, you got to do what you got to do. I was thinking about Frank, something that you, you said, and it, it just, and it's just been like noodling in my head about the kind of like, I, whatever, how the sort of foundation of America. And, and I was thinking, all right, we were at some point we couldn't like, we as a world couldn't imagine what it would be to, to live without the rule of Kings. And so some folks crossed the ocean to be like, we are going to imagine a new place that is without the rule of Kings. But then what always happens is you've been a victim and then you, you can't wait to perpetuate <laughs> power on the other. And mm -hmm. so actually from the beginning, the country has always been, you know, we just crossed the ocean, some folks, not my folks, uh, uh, crossed the ocean going, I'm going to seek freedom. And then in seeking freedom, subjugated the people to whom the land already belonged. Uh, and then we told the story about who those people were, right? And, and then we put them in movies, Cal boys in Indian movies and, you know, the cowboy with the big hat and the John Wayne and the, you know, shooting the bad guys that were helping that were um, postponing progress. And then, and so like the, you know, slavery was like inevitable, right? It's inevitable. It's like, of course, we're going to bring some other folks here who, for whom this land is not um, their home. And we're going to make them work for us so that we can have the dream that we left an entire continent to have, not thinking that you left a continent to have a dream that is, is a dream that every single human on this planet actually has. And so just examining the idea of the American dream is like foundational to this moment. From the moment we started, we've actually been transgressing um, our own possibility uh, as humans who can share the planet. So I don't even know where we begin. It almost seems like, you know, like every, every 
and I haven't, you know, studied every culture, but I think most cultures, they have their nigger, you know, it's like, why do we need that? Why do we need that? You know, um, and James Baldwin said, you know, you know, I'm not your nigger, you know, uh, but I mean, it's like, but it's like in order for me to feel good about myself, I have to put somebody else down. And I'm like, it's, it's, I mean, I think that's the change that I would really like to, um, to see happen if you know it's very Pollyanna very like hold my hand and sing kumbaya but I mean like to look at like why do we need every why do we need someone to look down on I was in Europe and people looked at me and like they they, they thought I was from Africa and they're like Ugh. and I said I'm from America they're like oh okay cool because we hate Africans you know so everybody's got this you know so the beginning of the COVID crisis, the, all of the violence that was being perpetrated on, you know, Asian Americans here in New York City, and they're teenagers of color who are like, you know, committing violent acts, you know, to Asian folks on the street. And what does that come from? That comes from the fact that you have no power anywhere else in your life. The moment that you can get on top of another human, you're like, Phew. but that is being taught to taught how do we take that out of the lesson mm -hmm. oh. that in order to have that doesn't mean that someone else has to have not right. that That's there is right. infinite space there is abundance there is enough for everybody it's not a fiction we just have not internalized that truth I don't have anything else to say. No, it's, um, it's so my question for you, 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 you mentioned the panic attack. Do you feel that the George Floyd murders and the situation it put an additional burden of you in that lockdown that you felt that is one more layer of this unhealthy situation we are in, not being, not going out, not being able to talk, touch people that stuff others don't have to experience? of this is like we all have like skeletons in our closet and it just like you know george floyd sort of like the door like the, there's one too many skeletons and the door opened <laughs> you know i'm just like pff, there's like just this spill out it's not it's not it's not a not an additional trauma it's the that we're all coping we're all coping and this was just for me it was just like oh gosh come on really i can't even like this is, yeah, and of, and of course, this is a trauma that is part of our daily lives and it's just illuminated, it's light. It's not darkness, it's light um, that was put forward. And, you know, we have to be appreciative um, of Breonna Taylor and, you know, uh, Ahmaud Aubrey and George Floyd and Freddie Gray. And, you know, it took, it's like piles and piles and piles. It's like, like a whole bunch of light just is keeps coming on until you hopefully we can not turn away and we can just see um, what's in front of us and the destruction that is 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 laying and the heartbreak and the disappointment and you know I mean Tony McDade I, I I'm and this is just and I'm missing whoever else in the last ten days because these names are now you know this is ten days ago. So I can't even, I don't know. I, I, I don't think that there's an additional burden. It's simply that um, I decided that I was tired. <laughs> That's what happened. Like, yeah, I'm gonna just say I'm tired instead of pretending that I'm not tired. Yeah. I'm gonna say I'm exhausted. I don't know, James, for you, what? Um. I, you know, it, I, I, I feel that this, this, uh, where we're at, race and racism is is intentional. And by little things like I just got today on TV, and I can't get this out of my head. He was saying that we don't have government records of how many black men have been killed by policemen, but you can find easily out how many people have been killed by jellyfish. You know. And it's like, it's, it's intentional. It's, you know, 
and, and, and it's like, and I guess there's like, if we hide the facts, maybe they will, you know, I don't fill in the blank. I don't know. Um, but I think um, this is a real time for, you know, truth. And unfortunately, you know, 45, that's not one of his strong suits, but, um, <laughs> you know, but, you know, maybe, maybe he's just the right one you know, for this, this thing, cause he's gonna, whatever happens, he's gonna be there throwing gasoline. Mm -hmm. So things haven't been bad enough, you know, for, so now there, we, but when it comes to theater, if I, since we also, you know, we are all part of that community and, um, and it's a great community. I think the most generous people, the most uh, uh, people who are close to the, also the history and the fight for freedom over centuries have been part of that so now what what's on your guy's mind do you think things will change in your practice will you do something different um what what are you thinking about about or do, do you even think about go back to perform and do theater yeah i luckily enough i am the coaches director of a theater uh who built into its mission is representation uh and we are you know and i have a really great partner mark Pleasant and you know who I just you know love this man and think that um, you know we're we're agreed on the task you know that we have to uh, make up for lost uh, time and lost effort and and amplify the mission of working theater to make sure that the voices of working folks a lot of brown black folks are 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 present on our stages and that our stages aren't just these exclusive spaces midtown, but those stages are inside of the communities of the people um, who actually make this place what it is, who enrich us culturally, um, experientially, uh, um, um, because we exist as neighbors. And so, yeah, and, and we're talking about transparency and like ways to put artists in charge of their processes, um, as opposed to sort of building the kind of, the sort of pyramid of, of you know, little boss, medium boss, people who have no power <laughs> on the bottom. So how do we redistribute um, uh, uh, access, um, wealth um, and opportunity? I am. Uh, I I made a decision early on in this COVID thing that I would, um, when it's over, I'd look back on this time and I would um, think that I used this as a gift. I'm a glass half full guy, and I'm like, you know, this is a horrible, horrible time. Um, but personally, I have time, you know, and um, I have thoughts in my head, and I am executing. You know, I'm talking to Tamala now about uh, uh, like what we can do um, um, outside of the realm of, you know, of a, of a, of a theatrical experience. And what does that mean? And um, it's, you know, it, we're, um, when I get presented with a problem, I try to look at it like an opportunity. And, um, and this is a huge problem, you know, the whole race and the political thing and the, 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 the the distance from theater, which is, you know, um, my, you know, artistic home that there is no such thing. I mean, I, I don't know when we're going to be okay with somebody coughing behind us and be like, Oh, it's just someone coughing, you know, I'm not dying. Um, so yeah. Um, but what does that mean? How can I bring theater into people's homes? And that's, that's what I'm, that's what I'm uh, interested in, in, in pursuing. You once, I think you came to a prelude, right, with your piece on um, police shooting a um, long, long time ago. Would you do the same piece or would you do it differently now? Uh, are things, do you feel things are changing um, in forms? That was Disposable Man, and, and it was back in 2005, and it's being shown tomorrow on, on, on here. Um, and I did Three Fists, and I think that, you know, um, I... I don't know. I I think I'm um um I'm not I don't know, to be honest. I'm working on a piece um related to my experience with 9-11 now, which is a, a whole different thing. But uh yeah, that's that's where my head is at right now. Um I think there's everywhere you look, you know, people are aware that black men are getting shot and killed. I don't feel like I need to um um highlight that 
fact. It's everywhere, you know. Um, and hopefully something is gained from it. You know, today I was looking at this uh, woman whose um, son was killed and the lawyer was like, please give us the video, the, the, the body cam video before you release it to the public. And of course they, the police were like, you know, whatever. They released it, put it on YouTube. This mother um, discovered her son's video by her friends calling her, telling her it's on YouTube, you know. So there's, all, you know, like I don't know that. Um, I think that's being that's it's being done. The, that work is being done. I don't I don't know what I can do. Um, we need joyful stories. We need. Yeah. What do we need now? Like what do, What do we need? What is meaningful? <laughs> what What do you think we should be doing? I think we should. I think we should tell the stories about the future we want. That's what we should do. We should put into into practice. We should start rehearsing the future we want. We should put it in front of audiences so they can see that it's possible. That if it exists in my imagination, it can actually exist in the real world. Those are the stories we need to be told. We need to tell the stories of the future. Um, come on, Black futurists, let's do it. <laughs> That's what we need. We need to put forward what can be, should be, must be. Um, and that is, you know, and those, how do we exist in like profound joy and light and grace and generosity and see black folks <laughs> existing in abundance and not suffering. Uh, yeah. yeah, James, yeah. related to what you're saying, like, don't, don't watch me suffer. I don't want you to see me suffering. Mm -mm. Hmm. Want to make some joyful stories, James? <laughs> I, am, I am an angry black man now. I mean, like, you know, I, you know, did some, you know, that said, I mean, I, I must find reasons on a daily basis to laugh, you know, at myself, at something. Because otherwise, you know, hand me a razor blade, I'll slip my wrist, you know. But I mean, there's, there's joy in my life. And I think that, um, um, um yeah i think that there is a there is joy. actually i'm writing a piece of, that that's kind of joyful but you know mm -hmm. yeah i know <laughs> <laughs> oh, god the tough times frank i yeah. think uh, do me a favor yeah uh talk to your people will you I will. Okay. I hope they are also listening, and um, and they are. But you're right. Yeah, we 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 have to. Yeah. Talk amongst yourselves. Yeah. They had eight minutes and 45, 46 seconds of silence in the, uh, the Senate the other day. It's such a long time. There should be no silences. We need to be done mm. with silence. I think it's helpful to, to realize it's one thing to say eight minutes and 45, 46 seconds. It's another to experience it, you know. I certainly, I couldn't watch the video. Um, but it's a long time. Yeah. Listen, guys, thank you really thank you for, you know, for, um, for, for joining us and sharing on this day, especially. And, uh, 
And I think what you said, we all should think very carefully about and um, to talk to us, ourselves, among ourselves, to think what we could do. And to also that perhaps that old Buddhist idea, the joyful participation in the sorrows of life. You know, we have to participate in the sorrows, but also in a joyful way. I think this is what theater does. It has always been on the side of life. It's been on the pragmatic side to find solutions that people survive, to celebrate and show the conflicts openly, the murders and killings, but also love and uh, joy and uh, how close they are. And we really experience them even so they don't seem to be real, but they are real for that moment. And as Tamalia said, why theater is interesting, it's a model for something. If it happens in your imagination, it happens on stage, it could happen in life. And that's why a lot of people we talk to there, governments suppress it, forbid theater. They, Films are okay, television is okay, it could be more radical, but if it's shown on theater, it's, it's getting censored. Because there's something powerful in it. And, um, and yeah, so we all really, really have to think uh, what we're doing, everyone. And I think, um, and uh, it was a long, longer term uh, mission and no easy answers. Of if it, as Einstein said, if it uh, would be solved, could be solved, it wouldn't be a problem, right? So that's why it is a problem often, you know, because it can't be solved and the people are not able to solve a problem. Other ones who are also um, connected to it because they can't. And uh, we really have to uh, work hard to do this. Coming to, to a close, what do you, I mean, you have said already so much, but still for young artists, people, you know, Tamila, I remember you are so starting out and and James, what, what would you say to your younger selves? Or do you, what do you say to young artists who now couldn't even graduate, can't send out their plays, uh, can't act, can't have, don't have auditions, um, uh, plays aren't, as far as we know, no, not being, being read. On the contrary, I think, Lenordish said, the commission she got, they said, give us your money back, even so, our money back. She started writing on it, you know, I mean. So, but what do you say to young artists how to engage in a meaningful way from your experience in life? Yeah, I think of my friend Leslie at school, he told me, uh, and I think of this all the time, it's like, you have to remember the feel of your own destiny and let that be the fuel for the stories that you want to tell. Um, that's what I'd say, like, just remember the feel of your destiny keep moving forward yeah I, I think um i've been in um groups where um writers would write uh, a, a, a two-person show because the um the hope was that would be easier to produce and i think that's fine if you're a writer who writes two-person shows you know go do it but if you're a writer who um, writes shows that um, need more, um, I would encourage you to, to do it and find someone to put it on. I mean, I think one of the things that really shifted everything for me was when I was in a group and this woman, she, happened to be, she was a white woman, and she said, um, I, I did this thing with horses in a drive-in theater. I'm like, how do you get horses in it? You know, and I was just like, I want to be a white woman, you know? <laughs> you know, but I realized it wasn't so much that she was a white woman, it was that she asked. She went up to the guy with the drive in theater and she asked for it. She went to the guy who had the horses and she asked for it. And I think about her often when, you know, I get to the point where I'm like, I want to do something. And, you know, who can I ask? And it's hard, it's really hard. And you have to be brave because people are gonna say no, but I got a good friend who always says, well, they ain't gonna punch you in the face, you know, <laughs> most likely, <laughs> you know, so ask. And I'm, I, I will ask and, you know, and there, there's no way in the world that a piece like Three Fists gets done. We had five weeks of rehearsal, a four week run in, in a theater with 23 actors, 30 collaborators, 22 video projectors. It's just in an off, off Broadway, that's, it's never gonna happen. But you know, we didn't know that it couldn't happen. So um, I think 
Um, what I would encourage um, young artists to do is follow your heart. And that sounds really corny. But um, if you are a writer or a creator that does very small pieces that are one-on-one, -on -one, great. If you're the writer who needs an army full of people, do it. Find somebody to put it on. There are, there are people, you know, and um, yeah, follow follow your your own, what, what, what makes sense to you and embrace, you know, your own ignorance that helps you, you know. Yeah, and that's as you say. It all sounds uh, simple or easy or complicated, but it's it's a that's real advice and it's significant and it's also true. And uh, thank you both for speaking the truth, for sharing um, this, this moment today, this day with us, and your thoughts. And uh, and uh, we can't wait to see what you all will come up with. And when you're back on the stages of New York and you share with audiences your experiences and. And uh, we know we need the audiences, you know, to, to, to be there. It's also something we learn now. And um, so uh, that we all, our community, but we really have to look at what we do. And this is a moment where, where we can do that. And we really, really have to, if anything we have learned from these days, we have to, to um, ask questions maybe we never wanted to ask. We have to see things maybe we didn't want to see things. So tomorrow, if you can join us, we have a, a great philosopher, a significant uh, philosopher on um, contemporary philosophy from France, Jean Luc Nancy, who wrote a lot about public and public space. What's we? What is I? On love, also, uh, is a great, great thinker. It's a big honor for us to have us here. Um, Thursday, we have Avoye Timpo with us, a great director um, who did the great feast uh, with us. Also, I love that play, uh, that musical things came from the Royal Court and the National London never got done in the US. We tried very hard. Um, that was one short version um, um, and done it, but uh, she did so so beautifully. And then Woody King Jr., um, I'm gonna yeah. talk to him on Friday. He asking for 50 years. He's run a black theater in New York, tried to do the new federal. So many people also went through his work. How does, how does he experience the moment? How does he, the, he see what, we, what we're doing now? So that's truly um, um, of, of uh, of real interest. So um, I hope you uh, will join us again and listen. I think it is important for you guys to say what's on your mind, but it's also important really for us to listen. And I think our listeners and we get comments and from many, many countries and states in the US, you know, where people are perhaps listening a little bit more careful. So thank you, it's important. We need good theater, but we also need good audiences, good people, because ultimately it's about you, the listener, the viewer, the audience, what do you do with it? It's not good enough to know something, but what do you really do? And, um, and the theater artists are great because they do something and they see something earlier, perhaps a bit. I see they are in the moment, but they also anticipate as the both of you did with, um, with your work. So um, next week we have T Tanya Bruguera with us from Cuba and also many, many others. So I hope you um, will join us again. It's week 11 for us now, and um, it's a privilege for us to listen and share so many uh, voices from around um, um, the world. So um, James and Pamela, really um, thank you for being so open, um, honest, uh, and uh, in this moment, which we could feel, you know, that it's not easy for, 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 all, for all of us, not easy to speak, but it's not easy to listen, but it's a, it's a serious moment, and I think that's what what would we need and theater if it ever had anything to say in the arts it's now we are of significance we have been a change this is the stories we heard from south africa under apartheid in chile and mexico and colombia how theater has been a contributing force to change and i think it's time again to think really really through how we can be that even better and more clearly so thank you all for listening thanks to how round um, Thea, Vijay, and Travis for hosting us, and uh, my team, Andy and Sanyang, and uh, please do join us again tomorrow with Jean-Luc Nancy. Uh, look him up. Um, if you don't know who he is, it might be also, like today, it might be really an important talk. Thank you. Bye-bye.